This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. Here come the earnings. Stocks soar ahead of profit reporting season, and it could be results from the big banks that push the market even higher. Return of subprime? Those loans disappeared after the financial crisis, but now they're back with a new name and soaring demand. Let's go shopping. Nordstrom's opening stores while other retailers are closing them, and the company needs this strategy to succeed. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, April 12th. And we do bid you a good evening, everybody. Another day, another triple-digit move in the Dow, this time to the upside as tensions between the United States and Syria ease. The cooling off today of geopolitical tensions allowed investors to focus back on market fundamentals and the beginning of earnings season, which gets underway tomorrow. Today, the Dow rose by 293 points, back above 24,000. The Nasdaq added 71. The S&P was up 21 today. The financial sector helped lift the broader market, and that's key because some of the biggest names in the industry report their quarterly earnings tomorrow, and expectations are high. Bob Pisani reports tonight from the New York Stock Exchange. Stocks were in rally mode, more than erasing yesterday's losses after President Donald Trump tweeted that a missile attack on Syria may not be imminent after all. Now, with trade war fears and geopolitics brushed aside, at least for the moment, Investors are eager to move on and shift their focus back to earnings and the fundamentals. Analysts are expecting a spectacular earnings season. First quarter earnings are slated to jump more than 18 percent. That would mark the best growth for the S&P 500 in seven years. Now we're waiting on the big banks to kick things off tomorrow, starting with J.P. Morgan, Citigroup and Wells Fargo. Bank earnings will be crucial to watch since financials are expected to be one of the biggest contributors to earnings growth. They're about 15 percent of the total market capitalization of the S&P 500. That's the second biggest group after technology. So there are fairly high expectations for banks due to a combination of positive factors. We have higher interest rates. That's a big help to banks. We have lower taxes. We have higher volatility that should result in more trading profits at the biggest banks. And we've got less regulation. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Sundi Bagat is, uh, he joins us now to talk more about what to expect as the first quarter earnings get underway. He is Chief Investment Officer at Whittier Trust. Good to see you, Sundi. Thanks for joining us tonight. Glad to be here. We talk about how high expectations are. Is it warranted this time around, do you think? I think so. Look, we were in the middle of an earnings recession not too long ago. Uh, we have come out of that very nicely. We have synchronized global growth. Corporate profits are rising. Not a single quarter this year is expected to produce earnings growth of less than 17 or 18 percent. So there is actually a lot to like about this upcoming earnings season and looking ahead to the rest of the year. So let's take a, a look, if we could, at who you think are going to be the winners in terms of sectors and who might be the losers. Let's start with the good news, the winners. Look, uh, let's be careful about paying too much attention to a single quarter. But as it stands right now, consensus expectations call for the very cyclical energy and material sectors to be the winner. These will experience earnings growth of at, at significant levels, 70 percent, 40 percent. Keep in mind they're coming off of depressed levels. Mm -hmm. Rounding out the list of winners are some more uh, cyclical sectors, technology, financials, industrials. Uh, and I'm afraid the laggards are your more defensive sector. So utilities, consumer staples are, are likely to produce less stellar growth in this first quarter. And consumer discretionary and health care. Um, but retail has done pretty well here lately. Uh, why do you think the consumer will, will lag a bit here? Yeah. So this is where the vagary of a single quarter yeah. uh, data point comes into play. This is simply a comparison from earnings from a year ago. For the full year, consumer discretionary stocks, that whole sector, is expected to have earnings grow at a healthy 15 or 16 percent, very close to the market expectation. So I would just point that out. Uh, wages are going up. Remember, that created the specter of inflation. But the flip side to that is disposable incomes are going up, and mm -hmm. that should help consumer spending. I tend to be a worrier. So what I worry about is that we've been hearing that these earnings are going to be very good this time around. But how much of that is already in some of those sectors and, and some of those specific names? So, look, we are 
right on the cusp of the reporting season. And the market's job is to anticipate these a good six or 12 months ahead in mm -hmm. advance. So a lot of the market rally in late 2017 was pricing in these expectations. To state the profoundly obvious, the only thing missing from these expectations are the unexpected, the so-called surprises that we will see. But going beyond the first quarter, a lot of good news may have been priced in for 2018, but I'm not sure if the market has started to focus on 2019. There is so much worry that this is as good as it gets, that we are at the peak of the earnings cycle, right. suggesting that earnings will now begin to go down. And I don't think that is the case. Let's take a moment and focus on the big group tomorrow. Of course, uh, that may be the most anticipated, the, the bank's financials uh, that Wall Street watches here. Should Sue be worried about them as well? Uh, I think the banks will do fine. So, look, we have threatened and worried about this higher level of volatility. Of course, it creates an opportunity for the banks to register higher revenues from trading activity. At some point of a yield curve, the difference between long-term and short-term interest rates will, will, will normalize. It has been artificially depressed by low non-U.S. interest rates. That uh, evolution will help bank earnings. So financials are actually one of the most attractive sectors in the market uh, that we see for the next 12, 18, 24 months. All right. Sundeep Bhagat with Whittier Trust. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure. General Electric is reportedly considering a public offering or a spin-off of its transportation business. According to the Wall Street Journal, GE has been examining different scenarios for the division. Such a move would be part of a bigger restructuring at the company, which has seen its stock fall about 25 percent this year alone. In an interview with CNBC, CEO John Flannery discussed GE's road ahead. And Morgan Brennan has more. General Electric CEO and Chairman John Flannery once again reiterating his strategy to turn around the struggling industrial company. We know we have great franchises. We know we can run them better. Mm -hmm. All those things, cash, capital. So there's a nucleus of strength and improvement that we see right in front of us. I also came in and said, we're in, it's just too many things at once. My core responsibility is to make sure those businesses flourish in the future for the employees, for the customers, for investors. And in that context, I'm open to any way I can make that happen. But it's still a strategy without many details. Also, not exactly ruling out the possibility of a broader breakup. Even though GE also does a lot of business and manufacturing in China, Flannery is not worried about a trade war between the U.S. and that country. I think fundamentally, you know, my belief is over time, people are rational about what uh, what is in their collective best interest. So when I look at that, I say this will sort out over time in a sensible way for both parties. So uh, will there be a lot of noise? Will there be a lot of, you know, uh, maybe drama along the way? Probably. GE's chief executive, who's been at the helm since August, addressed the challenge of keeping good people on board, even as steep cost cuts have resulted in tens of thousands of layoffs. Anytime you're in a situation like this where there's, you know, uh, stresses, change, pressure. There, there is, there, there's a, an element of that population that really rises up and says, hey, I, I love being in this right now. Th this is yeah. like an amazing opportunity. I can help reshape an iconic company. I can help, you know, be part of a turnaround. That, that is an incredibly motivating uh, force to people. All of this as investors await restated financial results for the past two years thanks to new accounting rules. And then first quarter earnings, which are due out next Friday followed by a shareholder meeting at the end of the month. Meantime, given all of the uncertainty around the company, the stock is down another 25% this year, and more than 50% over the past 12 months. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. Elsewhere, the World Trade Organization is warning global leaders that a trade war would damage the worldwide economy. In a new report, the body says that the current state of trade is the strongest it has been since before the financial crisis, but it could falter if trade tensions escalate further. The director general of the WTO said the trade retaliation is the last thing the world economy needs right now. President Trump has instructed top administration officials to explore re-entering the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade pact. He pulled out of that pact, you might recall, last year. Following a meeting at the White House, Republican Senator Ben Sass says the 12-nation free trade deal would be the best way to counter alleged Chinese trade abuses. 
Definitely the big headline coming out of this meeting is that the president said he was deputizing Larry Kudlow and Ambassador Lighthizer to look at re-entering the TPP negotiations. In an interview with CNBC back in January, President Trump said he would reconsider the Pacific trade deal if it were, quote, substantially better. Well, the threat of terrorists from the U.S. course is sending a chill through some of China, China's businesses, including high-tech ones with global ambitions. Yunus Yun is in Dongguan, China tonight for us. The inventor of this underwater drone never thought it would be in the crosshairs of President Trump. Chinese startup QIC makes drones for divers and companies who might need to film underwater. Founder Belinda Zhang had expected to ship her first drones to the U.S. in June, but now she's uncertain after President Trump announced tariffs targeting China's high-tech goods. Of course, for us, we do not think it's fair because we can provide good product with the low price. We're in the manufacturing south, what's known as China's workshop of the world. But as the economy here advances, the country wants to move away from making toys and shoes and into higher tech products like drones. To do that, China has an official program called Made in China 2025, supporting certain technologies like drones, electric vehicles and artificial intelligence. The Trump administration believes it's an unfair attempt to promote Chinese high tech with the help of the state. The Shenzhen-based startup received around $63,000 from the government, which it spent on R&D, less than 2 percent of all the financing it raised. Zhang is unsure if her drones will end up on Trump's final list, but she is sure China will continue pursuing its own policies. For the whole industrial development, I think it's, it's a good thing. If we get more support from the government and we can have this technology development very fast. Exactly what the Trump administration fears is harming America's competitiveness. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yoon in Dongguan, China. It is time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Mylan's rating was raised to outperform from market perform at Lyrinc. The analyst there cites the generic drug maker's diversified business model and its ability to grow profit and sales over the next several years. The price target is $52. Shares of Mylan rose 2 percent today to $41.26. Citi cut its price target on Bristol-Myers Squibb to $70 from $78. After a meeting with Pfizer's management, the analyst says Pfizer has no interest in acquiring Bristol or entering into any other large-scale deal. The rating on Bristol remains a buy. The stock fell 2 percent to $58.84. Bed Bath & Beyond saw its price target cut by at least eight firms following that disappointing earnings report we told you about last night. One of those firms is KeyBank, which now has a price target of $16 on the stock, one of the lowest on the street. The analyst there says increased competition will lead to even more pain for the retailer. Shares decline nearly 20 percent today to $17.21. And Puma Biotech also saw its rating cut to equal weight from overweight, this time at Barclays. The analyst says that much of what has driven that stock is now priced in. Price target cut to $70. That's the lowest price target on the street as well. Despite the downgrade, those shares rose by 1% to $67.10. Still ahead, remember subprime loans? Well, they helped fuel the financial crisis. So why are high-risk mortgages making a return? The number of Americans filing new claims for unemployment has now been at a record low, uh, for a record amount of time, that is. Jobless claims decreased by 9,000 to a seasonally adjusted 233,000 in the most recent week. Claims have now been below the 300,000 mark for 162 consecutive weeks, the longest stretch on record. Mortgage rates were undeterred by some of the recent moves in the bond market. According to Freddie Mac, the average 30-year fixed rate rose just slightly to 4.42 percent. That gives buyers a little bit of breathing room during what's expected to be a competitive spring selling season. So you remember subprime mortgages? They were those faulty loans made to borrowers with low credit and high debt, and they in part brought down the housing and financial markets a decade ago. And now they're back. 
And as Diana Olick reports for us, there's high demand for them from both borrowers and investors. Subprime, just the word conjures up these images. They disappeared following the financial crisis, but now lenders are dipping back in. Just don't call them subprime, call them non-prime. We're not going back to the bad old days of ninja lending when people with no jobs, no income, and no assets were getting loans. That, that was just crazy and it was layering risk upon risk. Now, Carrington Mortgage, a mid-sized lender that mostly does FHA loans, is expanding into the non-prime space focusing on the estimated 20% of Americans who have FICO credit scores below 600. Carrington will accept borrowers with credit scores as low as 500. Today's average borrower is in the mid-700s. Recent credit events, like a foreclosure or bankruptcy, are okay, as is a history of late payments. Loans up to $1.5 million and cash out up to half a million dollars. Self-employed borrowers can use bank statements to verify income instead of tax documents. Carrington says there is big demand from both borrowers and investors. We're going to keep some of the loans on our books, but we're also going to securitize some of the loans. We believe there's actually a market today in the secondary market for people who, who want to buy non-prime loans that have been properly underwritten. Properly underwritten, that's the key to watch. Carrington claims it will manually underwrite each loan to account for individual risk. So if you're higher risk, you might have to have a higher down payment or more cash reserves. Your interest rate will be higher. But is that enough? If we see regulators ease up and loosen the rules, as actually we've been seeing since this administration came in, uh, and if, if folks in the market haven't learned uh, the lessons from the last crisis, then that could be an issue. And if lenders and borrowers alike look at today's fast rising home prices and forget that prices can fall too, that could be a costly issue as well. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. And to read more about these non-prime mortgages, you can go to our website at nbr.com. So Bill, an influx of investor cash helped the results over at BlackRock, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. During a period with increased market volatility, the world's largest money manager delivered earnings that topped estimates as total assets under management saw an uptick to more than $6 trillion. A new lower tax rate helped results as well, as did a scramble by investors to rebalance their portfolios. We saw huge inflows and huge outflows. Uh, we had one client who sold a big pool of money for an M&A transaction. We had other clients were selling uh, assets to, for more CapEx. It was a combination of everything, but nevertheless, we did right. see consistent interest. We're seeing more and more interest in global investing. Shares of BlackRock climbed about 1.5% to $533.01. Delta Airlines reported higher than expected earnings and revenue, even as higher fuel and labor costs impacted its results. The airline CEO was pleased with the performance. We had a great first quarter in terms of demand. Record revenues for Delta, up 8% top line, uh, driven, interestingly, not just on the domestic system, but for the first time in several years internationally. In fact, our international revenues outpaced our domestic revenues in terms of growth. A really strong quarter, and it gives us some good momentum going into second quarter. Delta shares finished higher by nearly 3% to 52.98. Right Aid's results were in line with Wall Street estimates, but its upbeat forecast is what investors hung on to. The pharmacy chain said its merger with Walgreens will help increase earnings and sales for the year. Shares of Right Aid were off a fraction to $1.63. Bill? Sue GoPro has reportedly caught the eye of a Chinese company that may be interested in making an acquisition offer. A report from The Information said that electronics maker is based in China. It has considered buying the camera maker, but it doesn't want to overpay. GoPro CEO had previously said that he is open to a deal. Shares of the company were up 7% on that news to $5.22. And shareholder Berkshire Hathaway says it plans to vote against USG Corp's new board nominees as it pushes USG to reconsider that nearly $6 billion takeover offer from Germany's Knauf. Knauf, which also has a stake in the construction materials company, had asked shareholders to vote against the four nominees as part of its tactic to get USG to accept its offer. Shares of USG rose by 2% to 40.77.
And after the bell tonight, Broadcom said it was launching a $12 billion share buyback program. Shares in the after hours initially took off on the announcement. They finished the regular session down a fraction at 239.43. Well, the new tax law passed late last year was expected to hit many in high tax states hard. And now it appears many in those same states are looking for loopholes to limit their new tax burden. Robert Frank has the details. They are calling it the great conversion. Taxpayers turning themselves into limited liability companies and S-Corps in order to lower their tax bill under the new tax law. Now, the tax law that took effect January 1st allows LLCs and partnerships have a much lower rate than individual taxpayers. And corporations get the lowest rate of all. The question was how many people would actually exploit the new loophole, and the answer appears to be a lot. Data from high-tax states such as New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and California shows a huge increase in the number of LLCs, partnerships, and C-Corps. In New York, there were 27,000 new LLCs created between the end of last year and this March, a 15% jump. That's much faster than the growth rate of previous years. Now, new businesses in Connecticut was up 15 percent, and California saw a 12 percent bump. And we don't know how much of the increase was individuals asking for better taxes or just the stronger economy, but the tax law does have some guardrails designed to prevent this. It's harder, for instance, for lawyers, doctors, and accountants to use the pass-through rate, and there is an income cap. But the details and rules have yet to be clarified. And until then, a tax law designed to make taxes simpler has made it a lot more complicated and perhaps more costly for the government. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Robert Frank. And coming up, bucking the trend why Nordstrom is pouring a lot of money into a brick and mortar store while others are closing. Here's a look at what we are watching for tomorrow. As we told you, earlier, uh, earnings season kicks off with a number of banks reporting, including J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. A number of Fed officials will be speaking on the outlook for the economy, and the latest consumer sentiment report will show us just how the average American is feeling about their finances and the economy. And that's what we're watching for on Friday. State pension funding has hit a record shortfall. The annual report from the Pew Charitable Trusts said the funding gap hit a record $1.5 trillion in 2016. Pew said less money is being allocated to core government services, such as education and public safety, as states try to prop up their funds. The underfunding comes despite a nine-year bull run for the stock market. Sears is uh, closing several stores, and they'll be selling 16 others in an online auction. The troubled retailer is shutting locations in Chicago, North Carolina, Ohio, and Massachusetts. Those stories were not previously announced. It affects 166 locations in all. Other properties are being auctioned off with the help of Cushman and Wakefield. 200 investor groups have already expressed interest. And during a time when retailers are scaling back their brick-and-mortar operations, Nordstrom is bucking that trend. Today, the retailer opened its first department store in New York City, a risky move that the company hopes will pay off. Eric Chemi is there for us. Today marks a rare first in Manhattan, the opening of a brand-new, high-end, retail brick-and-mortar store. Nordstrom today opened its first full-line department store anywhere in New York City. It's also the company's first men's store anywhere in the country. It's a 47,000-square-foot facility, and next year, right across the street, they're opening an even bigger store. In an environment where traditional retailers are going bankrupt, shuttering stores, and pivoting to online, Nordstrom is bucking the trend by investing hundreds of millions to open an actual store. I can tell you we spent a lot on it. We've got to do a lot of business here, uh, but, uh, but we think if we execute well and, and serve the Manhattan customer the way they expect to be served, we're going to do a lot of business here. The family-run retailer needs this to succeed. The stock is about half what it was just a couple years ago, and online commerce giants like Amazon are stealing share across all portions of retail. Members of the Nordstrom family recently failed in their effort to take the firm private. In the meantime, the company is betting on the continued growth of men's high-end fashion, 
and that there will still be demand for people to come into a store. I shop online, everyone shops online, but I think when you want to come in and actually touch and feel and maybe have something that's more of an experience, um, I think this will be a great place to do it. I prefer to be in a brick and mortar. I prefer to touch the clothes, see the materials, try it on versus having to go to the post office to return it and then worry if it's going to fit or be damaged. This is no ordinary store. The company is merging the two worlds, online convenience and in-store availability. It will be open 24 seven, have quick return kiosks, same day delivery in Manhattan and new high tech customization tools. There are even cafes and a men's barber shop on site. The ultimate compliment is if other competitors start doing the same thing, or will this be a budget busting experiment? The company never repeats again. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eric Chemi in New York. And it's about time. Is yes, all I, I know. Say. I agree with you. Before we go, here's another look at the uh, bounce back on Wall Street ahead of the earnings season that starts tomorrow. The Dow was up 293 points today to 24,483. The Nasdaq added 71. The S&P up 21. We'll have to go shopping. I'm, I'm with it. Excellent. I'm there. That is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.